Truth in History with Charles A. Jennings. Welcome to Truth in History. My name is Charles Jennings, and I endeavor to bring a message from the Scripture this morning to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to start out by asking this question. In the light of modern theology, and in the light of what's going on in our religious world today, especially in the evangelical world, when there are so many ideas and thoughts and sermons that are man-centered, what I call anthropocentric sermons, centered on man, I want to ask a question. Do you believe, as a Christian, do you believe that Jesus Christ finished the work of salvation when he came to this earth? Did he complete the work? Or is there something else that we must do? Do we must or are we required to go back to the Old Testament to find our means of salvation? Or do we believe that the new covenant, when Jesus Christ said, I'm going to make a new covenant, that that new covenant fulfilled the old covenant of ordinances. Now, as I often do, I want to make a distinction between the four categories of Old Testament law. There were four categories. Number one was the law of ordinances. That's the law that I'm referring to today. That law has been totally, completely finished and fulfilled. The law of ordinances, blood sacrifice, meal offerings, drink offerings, you know, early in the day offerings, afternoon offerings, uh, priestly dress, special times, when to worship, where to worship, how to worship, all that's been done away with. The second category is the law of commandments, moral commandments. Those are still in effect. And then the law of statutes and judgments, they go together. Those are still in effect. And they, are, they were given to govern a society, to govern a nation. And our nation and other Israelite nations are violating those laws, and we're going to suffer the consequences. So I wanted to make that distinction for no one would misunderstand me in thinking that I have just thrown out the law completely. No, I have not. It's only the law of ordinances that I'm talking about in this message today. And I want to take a text from Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 14. You know, Jesus Christ in his teachings He had a lot of questions that people would ask him. John's disciples asked him questions, Pharisees, Sadducees, chief priests, and the masses, his own disciples. And he answered them mainly in parables or analogies of some sort. And in Matthew chapter 9, 
And we're going to start at verse number nine, nine, nine. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why eat us? your master with publicans and sinners. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bride chamber is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. If you notice, Jesus answer, there's a time element. He said, right now, the children of the bride chamber, how can they mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them now? But the days will come. There's a time element. There's a transition period. When the bridegroom shall be taken from them, that's when they shall fast. And then he clarifies things. No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment. For that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles. Else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish, but they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. What was Jesus referring to? He said, if you take a, a piece of new cloth and you put it in an old garment, that garment that is old, cannot contain it. It's going to rip. It's going to tear. It can't hold it. And if you take new wine and put it into old bottles, the old bottles cannot contain it. The old bottles or wine skins will break. And the new wine runs out. In essence, Jesus is talking about the transition from the old covenant of ordinances of Levi or Aaron to the new covenant, from the old covenant to the new covenant. You see, what he is saying here is that we cannot combine the old covenant ordinances dealing with man's atonement and forgiveness of sins and all that with the new covenant. Now, I realize that there are Christians today that they want to bring a lot of people back into the old ordinances, the old rites and ceremonies of Levi and of Aaron. And actually, they are mixing Judaism in there with the Old Testament Hebrewism, because those are two different things. 
and saying, well, for the Jews, whom they believe are God's chosen people, which they are not, their salvation is found in the Old Covenant. Folks, that is an abomination in the sight of God, and it's an affront to the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So the old bottles is referring to the old covenant ordinances, and the new wine is referring to a new and better way that Jesus made under the terms of the new covenant. So Melchizedek is the new wine. Levi is the old bottles. Levi is the old bottles. And Melchizedek is the new wine. And did Jesus, when he came and he ministered, did he finish the work that his father sent him to do? In John 4, 34, this is what he said. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. My question is, Jesus said that his purpose was to come and to finish the work of his heavenly father that sent him. Do you think that Jesus failed? A lot of these preachers apparently believe that Jesus failed. They have to go back and pick up something out of the old covenant. You got to worship on a certain day. I know that's a sensitive subject. And you have to eat certain things on certain feast days, and you have to attend certain meetings or celebrate feast days in some way or another. Different people do it different ways. But Jesus said, I have finished the work. My purpose or my meat is to finish the work that my Father sent me to do. In John 5.36, we read these words, but I have a greater witness than that of John for the works which the father hath given me to finish the same works that I do bear witness of me that the father has sent me. Here's a second witness. The works which the father hath sent me to finish. That means to complete. That means to bring to fruition. Also in John 17, 4. This is the Lord's high priestly prayer. And he said, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Why do I bring out these verses? It's because modern theology concerning Jesus Christ and his work on the cross by many ministries has gone in the ditch. They are still trying to do something or to satisfy God in some way and teaching and glorifying the wrong city, the wrong people, and the wrong theology. Now, what do I mean by that? They're still glorifying the old city of Jerusalem. You can see them on TV. They're going over there taking pictures. This is where Jesus is going to sit. This is where he's going to be in this 
so-called third temple. He doesn't need a third temple. He is the temple. He is the temple. He said it. He said, my body is the temple. And they're glorifying the wrong people, the Jewish people, saying these are God's chosen people. This is God's chosen city. We have to build this God-ordained third temple. None of the above are correct. They're not God's chosen people. The earmarks of true Israel in the Old Testament are given quite plainly, and they don't fit any of them, not even one. So modern theology is misguided. It's misguided. And some preachers are even saying that Jesus Christ needed to be saved. And that he descended into hell, a burning hell for three days and three nights. Or maybe was only there a day and a half, according to their theology. And that's where he paid for his salvation. That's nonsense. That's an abomination. I know their voice is being heard a lot more than mine. Because they're speaking to millions and, and, and bringing in millions of dollars. But I want to glorify Jesus Christ. I want to have him as our focal point in every theology or every area of our teaching. And we want to exalt him. And him alone. Now in John 19 verse 30. When Jesus was on the cross. Jesus therefore had received the vinegar. He said. It is finished. He completed the work which his father sent him to do. He did not have to go. To hell a burning hell, you know, in the center of the earth somewhere. No. That came out of Plato's belief. That's Platoism that came down through the ancient mysteries and finally came into Pergamos, the city of Pergamos. And then it was transferred over to the bishops of Rome. And they put it into their doctrine of the church, of the Roman Catholic Church. And it came down to the Protestants. And the Protestants believed it. It's Plato. Jesus didn't go preach to anybody in hell. That can be clearly explained. So Jesus said, it is finished. And when he said, if you try to put my work of the new covenant into old bottles of the Old Testament, they will break. They will not work. And he said the new wine would just run out and be spilled. Diluted of no good. So as we turn to the book of Hebrews. Once again, I would like to. Bring out. The difference the contrast between the two priesthoods in the book of Hebrews. And I have listed 14 different things, 14 different contrasts between the order of Melchizedek and the order of Levi. 
And I'm going to try to be concise and clear in these 14 things as I try to go through them. And they are contained in this book that I have put together concerning the ministry of Melchizedek. This book for an offering of $8. It's well worth it, folks. It will throw light on a lot of wonderful things in the scriptures. And we will also send you a free copy of our magazine. And if you just want the magazine, we'll send that to you free of charge. And, but we, we're asking an offering of $8 for the book. Basically, that just covers the printing of the book and the postage. We'll pay the postage. So we're not making any big profits on books. That's not our purpose. But I want to bring out the contrast in the book of Hebrews, chapter number seven, the contrast between the Melchizedek order, that's the new wine of the new covenant, and the order of Levi, the old priesthood of the Old Testament, and he would be old bottles. So number one, Melchizedek received tithes. That's found in, this is all in chapter number seven. Verse number two, by whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek who was Shem at the time. And that is found in Genesis chapter 14. Also in verse number four, it says, now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Verse six, but he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. If you have a Bible handy, I would encourage you to turn to Hebrews chapter 7 and follow along. Also, verse number 9, and as I may say, Levi also, who received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Abraham or when Melchizedek met him. He was, you know, he was great-grandson. He was the great-grandson of Abraham. But you see, the lesser paid tithes to the greater. So Shem, fulfilling the Melchizedek office at that time, Abraham recognized the greater priesthood. And he gave an offering to Melchizedek. So Melchizedek received tithes, but Levi paid tithes because the lesser pays or recognizes the greater. Number two, Melchizedek was not by genealogical descent. It says, verse 3, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. So he had no genealogical father to follow, like Aaron's sons followed Aaron. He had no genealogical order because this Melchizedek order was given or was conferred by oath, not by father, son, grandson, etc. Verse number six, but he whose descent is not counted from them. You see, not counted from Levi, because it's talking about Levi in verse five. Verse 15 it tells us this, 
And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. After the similitude, after the being similar in office and being, uh, having received that oath and receiving that office. You see, it's like the president of the United States. Just because one man is president doesn't mean his son will be president. No, it's conferred upon him. And verse number 16, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Melchizedek was not, that office is not by descent, but Levi was by descent. Number three, in verse 14, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, who was fulfilled that office, came out of Judah, a non priestly tribe, whereas Levi was from our Aaron and the priests, they were from that Levitical order. Number four, I know I'm repeating myself, but I'm trying to move on. In chapter seven, verse 17, it tells us, for he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That is taken from Psalm 110 and verse 4. Verse number 20. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. He could not be made a priest without an oath. And that office conferred upon Jesus Christ. For, who, for those priests were made without an oath. So Levi or the priest, I should say, Aaron and his sons, they didn't need an oath because their father was already a priest. Number five, Melchizedek, that is Jesus Christ, has endless life, endless life. Verse eight, and here men that re die receive tithes. But there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. Verse 16. Who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life? Verse 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That's Melchizedek. That's Jesus. But what does it say concerning Levi, concerning the Levitical priesthood? Those men died, verse 8 and verse 23. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Number six, Melchizedek blesses. He serves bread and wine. We read these verses already, but Melchizedek, Genesis 14, served bread and wine. What did Jesus do at the Last Supper? Matthew chapter 26. He served his disciples bread. He broke it and he gave it to them. 
said, Eat, this is my body. He gave them the cup, said, Drink, this is the new covenant in my blood. But what did the Levitical priests do? They didn't serve bread and wine. They administered the law. If therefore perfection were made by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. But Jesus came along and said, instead of administering law, I'm going to serve you bread and wine, and my body is represented by this bread, and my blood is represented by this fruit of the vine. Number seven. Verse 24, but this man, because he hath continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. One priest, Jesus Christ, is the only priest now. Just Jesus Christ, fulfilling the office of Melchizedek. But we see in verse 21, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said, the Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And verse 23, and they truly were many priests, many priests. Thousands of men served as priests in the Old Testament. Number eight, I've covered this already. The office of priesthood is forever. The office of Melchizedek priesthood is forever. But Levi, that order was temporary. It was temporary, strictly for that age. It had a beginning in 1453 BC, and it ended at Calvary, approximately 31 AD. It came to an end. It was designed that way from the beginning. Number nine, an unchangeable priesthood. I keep reading the same verses because these thoughts are contained in these same verses. And it says, an unchangeable priesthood. But Levi, the order of Levi and Aaron, you see, they had to change. They had to come to an end. They had to come to an end. Number 10, Jesus Christ as Melchizedek is a perfect priest. Perfect priest. And the Levitical order imperfect. It says, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? A perfect priest. The Aaronic priesthood, imperfect. It had to be done away with. Number 11, Jesus did not have to make 
a sacrifice for himself. In verse 27, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice for first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. He didn't have to make a preliminary offering to cover his own sin and then make another offering to cover the sins of the people. I'm trying to exalt Jesus Christ today and his priesthood. And in the Old Testament, Aaron, as he went into the most holy place, he had to make an offering for his own sin first and for his family members, and then another offering for the people. Jesus didn't have to do that. He made one sacrifice. One sacrifice. Number 12. I already read this verse. For this he did once when he offered up himself. And then in chapter 9, in verse number 12. Neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place. Not the holy place in Jerusalem in that physical temple, but the holy place in the heavens. He said in verse number 12, chapter 9, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having a, a, obtained eternal redemption for us. Old Testament priests, daily sacrifice, morning sacrifice, afternoon sacrifice, blood sacrifice, uh, oil sacrifice, meal sacrifice. You know, burnt offering, sin offering, etc., on and on and on. Jesus Christ made one sacrifice. Number 13, he offered himself. We, we read the verse already. Chapter 7, verse 27, he offered himself. The Old Testament. They held, had to offer animals, animal blood, insufficient. Number 14, in chapter 7 in verse 26, Jesus Christ was already consecrated forever, the sinless Son of God. Whereas Aaron had infirmities, he had weaknesses, he had sins, born into a nature that has a propensity to rebel against God, just like us, but yet he was made a priest of that order in the Old Testament. So he had to make sacrifice for himself, but Jesus was perfect. Hebrews 7, 27, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Can't get any better than that. And everything he did was better. Better hope, 
better sacrifice, better substance, better country, better resurrection, better thing, all in the book of Hebrews. Now, as we turn back to the book of Zechariah, we see this beautiful thought. In Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 12. And this is a prophetic word given by this prophet. This is what he said And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. We're not going to build it. Man's not going to build it. But the branch is going to build it. In Matthew 16, he said, I will build my church, which is his temple, which is our temple. He is our temple, and we are his temple. He's going to build it. This third temple concept, folks, I would encourage you, don't support it in any way. Don't waste your money. It's a substitute. It's a diversion. It's not of God. We have a temple. It's Jesus Christ. Verse 13, Zechariah 6. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. Ordinarily, priests don't sit on thrones. Kings sit on thrones. Aaron could not sit on a throne. Neither could any of the kings of Israel go function in the temple. And one of them tried it and was struck in with leprosy. He shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them. The council of peace between them, who's them? The two offices of king and priest. The Aaronic order was strictly priest. The Davidic order was strictly kingship. But Jesus, being our only Melchizedek priest, he bears both offices, and he's going to sit upon his throne as a Melchizedek priest that has completed his work, just like we read in the book of John. He said, I have come to finish my father's work. I have come to finish his work. So the work of Christ is complete, folks. You say, well, what, what part do I play? In my salvation. Well, it's like the old country boy said, I have 50% responsibility for my salvation. How's that? He said, I did the sinning, and Jesus did the saving. I did the sinning, and Jesus did the saving. John Newton. That man that composed that great song, Amazing Grace, said, I am a great sinner, but Jesus is a great Savior. 
on the cross, rely on it. Fix your heart on it. He said, it is finished. And he could only finish it by being the Melchizedek priest. And I realize I keep repeating myself on this, but this is ever so important, especially these days when men in churches and on television, they're preaching this so-called gospel, so-called gospel, that the Jews don't need Christ. If they're going to be saved, they have a special contract that came through Moses. No, Moses was the administrator of the old covenant. Jesus Christ is the administrator of the new covenant. And he needs no man made temple. Revelation 21, verse 22. And I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Talking about New Jerusalem. I realize I may sound like a broken record, but this is ever so important. The list of 14 different contrasts between the two priesthoods are listed in this book. And we're offering this book, The Order of Melchizedek, for $8. We will also send you a copy of our magazine. And I have made up a chart, and we'll send you a copy of that chart also concerning the two priesthoods. And Jesus said, This is my blood of the new covenant. In the book of Hebrews, chapter number eight, verse number six. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Moses, mediator of old, Jesus, mediator of new, which was established upon better promises. For if that which, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Who did he make the new covenant with? The house of Israel and the house of Judah. And that does not include the Jewish people because they're not of Judah and they're not of Israel. And it's been shown, and I've taught it many times, that the true identification of the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Yes, you ready for the shock or the Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, Germanic, and related people? How else can it be? You only have three choices. The Jews are Israel, the church is Israel, or the Anglo-Saxon and related people are Israel. Where has Christianity been? Where's the trail or the route or the road of the gospel all the way from Palestine to the New World, North America, 
How did it get here? Did it go west? Or did it go east? It came west. And there's a lot to say on that subject. But folks, the Lord bless you. May this be an encouragement, an enlightenment, and an exaltation of Jesus Christ. Because he is the only one. We should worship him and him alone. Exalt him and him alone. Not ceremonies. Not certain dress. Or be under a guilt complex because you don't meet at a certain time. He fulfilled the law of ordinances. And he's coming back. Jesus is coming back as a king priest to sit upon his throne and to rule over the house of Jacob forever. God bless you.